Welcome to today's MPG Primer. We're very excited that you've decided to join us this morning for what I'm sure will be an exciting talk about image analysis. Um, we are fortunate to have two speakers today. Um, um, the first speaker will be Dr. Beth Simony, who heads the Simony Lab within the imaging platform at Broad. Her team works with biologists to help them create image analysis workflows. She is a CZI imaging scientist, a role recognizing her work on making open source image analysis tools more accessible to the bioimaging community. Simony's lab started at the Broad in 2021 after five years, um, after her five years as a postdoc and then computational biologist in Ann Carpenter's lab at Broad. She holds a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from the Blackburn lab at the University of California, San Francisco and a BA in biochemistry and molecular biology from Boston University. Our second speaker today will be Dr. Naranj Chandra Sekharan, a computational biologist um, and who is currently a postdoctoral associate in Broad's imaging platform. Naranj is leading a collaboration of 12 pharmaceutical companies and nonprofit organizations in generating the largest publicly available cell painting data set um, and developing machine learning based analysis pipelines to accelerate drug discovery. After completing um, a PhD in biophysics at UNC Chapel Hill, Naranj worked as a postdoctoral associate at the University of Massachusetts Medical School on algorithms for recognizing DNA copy number variation. Naranj is also an, an amateur astronomer. And so again, thanks very much uh, to you both for joining us. Um, I will mention to the audience that our speakers have kindly um, agreed to answer questions. So as they arise, please post them in the Q&A and, and um, Sarah will, uh, will uh, field them as soon as, as we can. So thanks so much and Beth, please get started when you wish. I myself after all these years of using Zoom. Um, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for having us um, today between the primer and the talks. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic uh, time here at MPG. Um, I want to just start from the idea that biological images, in addition to being pretty, can also be informative. Um, people think of uh, microscopy images a lot of times as, you know, representative image shown, um, which was the way microscopy images were used for the vast majority of the history of microscopy. You stained your cells with the things that you cared about, you took a picture, and you hoped that it was representative, um, and that you could tell something that was going on about biology based on the stains that were present. Um, but Imaging offers a few uh, a few sets of advantages that together are pretty unique for any technique um, in terms of the combination. We get single cell information, we get real time information, we get information about heterogeneity, um, and we can also see information about how molecules are interacting with each other. Um, and a lot of techniques offer some of these, but imaging we think really offers sort of the best combination, especially in terms of you know bang for your buck. Um, Despite all this, and despite the fact that, um, you know, cameras nowadays are typically in the megapixel range, so millions of pixels every time you snap an image, um, I'm guessing that the field probably hasn't changed that much in the few years since this paper came out. Most of the time when people are looking at microscopy images, they're looking at only one or two cellular features, um, which is a shame because, again, with millions of pixels, you have millions of pieces of quantitative data um, that you could potentially be mining. Um, that is not in any way to undercut the fabulous biology and the fabulous work that's done in this papers, but we've, uh, in the imaging platform, felt for a long time that it just means that there's more information and more discovery being sort of left on the table. Because we know there's information that's in images that, in general, human brains, which are designed to sort of react quickly to the environment around you and not necessarily to quantify things, just are not privy to. Um, so these are imaging flow cytometer images of cells in different cell cycle phases. Um, when I've given this talk in person before and I've asked who wants to raise their hand and tell me uh, what cell cycle phase is which, um, I've never gotten anybody to raise their hand on this. And that's because this is not a task that human brains are good at. Um, you know, when we get towards the end here and we see that cells are dividing in telophase, yeah, you could probably tell that that's what's happening once you understand the different cell cycle phases. But all of these look more or less the same to the human eye but not to a computer. Um, if we have, these cells also had DAPI ground truth that was used to uh, divide the cells into bins, but not actually to train cl a classifier to say which cell cycle phase is which. Um, and it turns out that based only on bright field information that you can actually do this extremely accurately. 
Um, and even in the cases where the algorithm is making a mistake, it's a mistake that is probably more to do with categorization. So for example, S phase sometimes gets confused as G1 or G2, but the transition from G1 to S to G2 is not perfectly switch-like. Um, those are not actually fully discrete cell states. Likewise, G2 going into prophase is not a perfectly switch-like state. And so the mistakes that the algorithm makes are just as much a fact of the thing that we're making a continuous process be in discrete bins as that the algorithm doesn't understand what's going on. And so because of this idea that information was hidden in images, um, the Carpenter and Schreiber labs about 10 years ago now, now started putting together this assay called the cell painting assay. And you're going to hear a lot more about cell painting and variants on cell painting um, in the second primer today, as well as in the actual talks afterward. But just to give you the sort of very brief overview, cell painting is designed to put the maximum number of organelles that can be stained with inexpensive dyes and imaged on a high content microscope together. Um, the panel was designed and optimized specifically to sort of get the most number of organelles for the least number of cost um, in compatibility with sort of standard microscope filters so that most people can do this. Um, and the idea is that you, um, you add some perturbations or maybe you take things from different patient samples um, you do the staining and perform high content imaging, and then do image analysis and feature extraction and extracting thousands of features. So typically we do about 6,000 features in a cell painting assay today. Um, and each one of those features may not tell you all of the biology on their own, but having so many features and then being able to cluster the data downstream, it turns out is really valuable and you can do extremely cool biological discovery. Um, so from there, I'm actually going to stop sharing slides and show you a little bit more about the tool that we typically use for feature extraction, um, which is a tool called Cell Profiler, which is also written the imaging platform. Um, Neuron Chandrasekharan, a little bit later, is going to then walk you through um, how the details of uh, uh, this clustering and how we turn features into answers to questions happens. So this is Cell Profiler. Um, cell Profiler at its heart is an image analysis workflow tool. So let me just pull up um, a different workflow to make it a little bit more obvious what that is. So Cell Profiler was created with the idea that sometimes you might want to do an, a microscopy analysis, not just on one image, but on many images. And so I can create this workflow by putting together individual image analysis steps. Those might be steps that are image processing or finding objects or making measurements and then ultimately saving out images or the measurements that I've made. Um, we put this together in a concept that we call a pipeline. And the pipeline is something that really adds reproducibility because this pipeline is simply a text file that you can look through and see exactly which settings were used in order to generate the data and the measurements that you're looking at. Um, the data about um, what pipeline was used, what all of the different settings were, what version of cell profiler, the date things were run, all of that is automatically encoded in the exported data that you save out. And so you always understand where your data came from, how it was made, and it really improves the ability to do good reproducible sort of complex image analysis, even if you don't know how to code. Um, knowing how to code is great, but it shouldn't be mandatory in order to do good uh, image analysis and good science. Um, so I'm just going to extremely briefly show you a, an image analysis workflow um, that uh, a couple of fantastic postdocs in my lab have put together um, that we call the beginner segmentation tutorial. Um, you can try this yourself later at tutorials.cellprofiler.org, and I believe um, Diane is also going to kindly put this in the chat as we get towards the end. Um, but we do have a lot of different tutorials at this site, and so if you're interested in sort of trying to up your skills in image analysis, we definitely recommend checking it out. Um, in addition to the written tutorials, we also have a YouTube channel with lots of videos. Um, so let me just um, drag in here. Um, we So you can share pipelines in these CP pipe formats and just sort of send a pipeline to your collaborator or attach it as supplemental information on a paper. Um, and that will allow you again to sort of make your workflows easy to use and make them reproducible. Um, 
there's some uh, bookkeeping that goes on in Cell Profiler that I'm not going to actually uh, tell you anything about right now because it's not that interesting. <laughs> um, and we have a relatively short amount of time. Um, and of course, because this is a live demo, I hit the wrong thing. Um, and now I have to you know, try and get this to unfreeze. Live demos, everybody. <laughs> um, it's just, uh, OK. Um, so in this experiment, so this is data from a from an older cell painting experiment, but the, the ultimate format is still the same. We have a number of different uh, dyes. We have the five cell painting dyes. Um, so that's the nuclei channel. And we also have plate-based illumination correction. And that is actually where we always start um, when we're doing high content screen analysis. Um, microscopes don't actually send your stain information or your stain uh, through the light path perfectly. Um, tiny imperfections in the glass can make it so that when we average images across a whole plate, you can see that light travels through this part of the microscope's light path a lot better than it does over here in the corner. And that can make it hard to sort of fairly measure cells across the whole thing. And so what we'll typically do is actually run an illumination correction pipeline first um, to generate these illumination correction functions that then we can apply to each image. And that will allow us to computationally make the whole field a lot more fair. And it turns out that that has a big impact on our ability to make reproducible measurements. Um, but typically what's the hardest thing to do in, uh, in any image analysis workflow is what we call segmentation, just finding what the object are and where they are and correctly identifying their boundaries. Um, in cell profiler, we typically use a module called identify primary objects for this. And so often our workflow is to start from the nucleus and then build a cell around it. Um, it's not necessary to do this, um, especially if you're working in a mono not a non-mononuclear cell line. So if you're working in, say, myocytes, where you have uh, more than one nucleus per cell, this workflow doesn't work particularly well. Um, but if you're working in a case where most of your cells should have one nucleus, um, it turns out to be a lot easier to um, start by um, finding nuclei and then building cells around them. So here's the output of what identify primary objects looks like. Um, here are the, here's the original image and here are the objects that were found. Um, right now it's not performing great, but I haven't changed any of the default settings at all. Um, we have some nuclei like this one here that are being missed entirely. And we have a lot that are also being broken into individual pieces. Um, this one that's missing here, you might be able to notice is outlined in magenta or pink. Um, and in cell profiler, the different colors here have codes. Pink means that it's outside the permissible diameter range that the module has set. And again, I'm just using here the default settings. Um, so all I in theory should need to do to fix this is to change the diameter range. So I'm gonna grab cell profilers length measurement tool. And you should see in the bottom right corner here, um, a length measurement as I click and drag across. So I'm seeing about 35, and that's the short axis, and about 50 on the longer axis, whereas these things are more um, 25 to 40. So I'm going to start with a pretty wide range to start. I'm going to go with 20 to 60 in terms of the my diameter range of objects. And then I just hit step again, and Cell Profiler will show me what my analysis looks like now. OK. This is a lot better. Um, I'm not missing anything except for things touching the edge, which I could choose to include um, by changing the setting from yes to no. Um, but in this case, I want to get rid of nuclei that are touching the edge because it probably means that their cells will not be fully captured. Um, I do notice that there is one case where I have two touching nuclei that look like have just divided um, that are being identified as one object, but this is pretty hard to pick up. So overall for a first pass, this isn't too bad. Um, often one of the really difficult parts of doing this is to um, make sure that your workflow is robust across lots of different uh, images. And so um, I can check um, a different image to see if it works well. 
I'm going to close the eye on this illumination correction calculation because I don't actually need to see it again. I know that my illumination correction factors look like they're correcting. And here's what I get now. Um, I'm going to actually pop the contrast on this a little bit because with those really bright mitotic cells, um, it's actually sort of blowing out the contrast. These are mitotic cells and, and these ones are too. Um, and again, this is overall not bad. Um, I do still have some places where touching nuclei are being counted as individual uh, objects rather than um, being split correctly. Um, and if we had a longer demo or when you play with this at home yourself later, um, I could use the advanced settings to try and tweak this a little bit. And I will try just sort of one, um, one pass at doing that. But overall, um, the performance here is pretty good. Uh, that I think made things worse. Um, I've now broken some cells in half that I didn't actually want to. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna tweak it further. I'm just gonna go back to the previous set of settings. But in Cell Profiler, you can tweak this and you can play around in lots of images and you can find a workflow that works well for everything that you have. Um, once I have my nuclei identified, I can build my cells around them from the nuclei. And I can, if my, so currently my thresholding is not working very well in that most of the cell is not being identified. And so I can change my thresholding settings. Uh, cell profiler ships a number of different algorithms in order to try and pick those up a little bit better. Um, so, uh, let's see, two pass. Um, and so once I've, uh, you know, in a typical workflow, I would spend more time trying to make sure all of these cells are accurately outlined. Um, but once I've done that, adding measurements and sort of figuring out what my workflow has done um, becomes really simple. I can separate the cells and the nuclei um, from the cytoplasm, which is the sort of area between the nuclei that I originally identified and the cells I built around them. And I can add measurements. And this is how we get to 6,000 measurements in Cell Profiler. We have just lots of measurement modules that we can click lots of fun little clicky boxes um, in order to add many, many measurements. And when I add, for example, a module like measure object intensity, and I say that I want to measure for cells, cytoplasm, and nuclei, um, what the intensity is, I'm not just getting one metric of intensity, I get many metrics of intensity for every object for every channel. And so you can start building up these really huge measurement suites, which turn out to be critical for the sort of bioinformatic work that Naranja is going to walk you through in just a couple minutes now. Um, but um, so in a typical cell painting workflow, we'd add lots of these measurement modules. We also typically like to overlay the pictures, um, and I recommend whatever image analysis workflow you're doing, cell painting or not, um, that you take um, you take a moment in your analysis workflow to uh, make a module that overlays pictures of the uh, segmentations that you've made, because segmentation is the crucially hard part and is really going to determine the success or failure of your image analysis. And so making an image like this, where we can see the outlines of the nuclei we've called on the image that we've called them on, and then saving that image out um, for future analysis, I can say from personal experience can save you an awful lot of heartbreak. Um, there's almost nothing sadder than thinking you found a really cool biological result. And it turns out that what you actually found was that your segmentation works in some, uh, in some uh, conditions, but not all of them. And then once I can save out a picture of the thing that I made, and then I can save out a spreadsheet with all of my measurements. And I can say that um, once I've done that, I will tell it where I would like my images and my spreadsheets to go and hit analyze. And this same workflow 
um, for each image is now going to be applied to actually 10 different image sets. And 10 is just the number that I happen to load. You can easily use Cell Profiler on hundreds or thousands or even millions of images, which is exactly what we did in the cell painting, uh, jump cell painting project that Naranj has been leading um, and that he will tell you about in just a moment. But you can see here that the analysis is proceeding pretty quickly and that this is automatically multi-threading on my computer. And so it will run as many workers as I permit it to or as I have CPUs on my machine. And I can get all of the measurements that I want from 10 images in under a minute. Um, so at the imaging platform, a big part of what we do is help biologists make image analysis workflows like these. So certainly um, uh, feel free to chat with us afterward. Um, but with that, I will stop uh, my share and hand things over to Naranj. Um, so yeah, good morning, everyone. I am Niran Chandrasekharan. I am a postdoc in the imaging platform. And before I get started with my talk today, I wanted to mention this link that I've provided here. This is a link to this very slight deck. So if you would like to go to the link and follow along, you may feel free to do so. Um, today, I will continue from where Beth left off and talk to you more about the remaining steps that exist in the process of converting images into morphological profiles. A bit already showed you this uh, figure here, but this is the overall um, image based profiling experiment. The left half of this image is the wet lab experiments, and the right half is usually the computational aspects of this uh, profiling experiment. And I won't focus on the wet lab parts at all. And at the first step of the computational steps, well, Beth has already talked to you about using cell profile and how to extract, uh, extract features from images. I'll only focus on the two other steps, which are how do you convert these features into profiles that can be used for, for downstream analysis. So once features have been extracted from cell profiler, they undergo a number of different profile uh, processing steps. So this is necessary in order to get the profiles ready for doing some downstream analysis. And the kind of workflow that you use for processing the profiles, it may depend on the type of data that you have or the kind of downstream analysis that you have planned. So it could change, uh, but in general, for most of the projects that we uh, work on in the imaging platform, we have this uh, default set of workflow that pretty much everyone can follow. And then if they need to change it in order to suit their data set, they may be able to do so. So today I'll focus on talking about this particular workflow that we commonly use. So this uh, busy figure here actually shows you the entire profiling workflow. On the left here, you have images and you extract features from them, you process the features, and then finally you do some downstream analysis. So it shows you every step along the profiling pathway. Um, most of the steps, apart from the first couple, can actually be per performed or run using our uh, open source Python-based software package called PySciPy Miner. Um, this figure in a way is getting uh, outdated very quickly because PySide Miner is being actively developed and there are a lot more features that are being added to it. Uh, but today um, you can actually get all the instructions for running these steps, starting from images all the way to generating the profiles uh, by following the instructions in the profiling handbook and the link that I've provided here. Uh, I'll now talk to you more about some of the important steps in this profiling workflow, the one that is part, the one set up part of the default uh, workflow for uh, profile processing. So Beth already discussed this. I won't go into too many details of uh, extracting features from uh, sing, uh, features from images and then converting them into single set profiles. So the cell profile workflow that Beth showed uh, just now, um, it typically outputs for a cell painting experiment, a bunch of files. Um, these are CSV files, which contain individual features from different compartments. There are cells, nuclear cytoplasm, and there are some other information about the image itself in the image.csv file. And then you have some experimental metadata information as well. 
So the first step in the profiling workflow is to take all these files and then convert them into profiles. So profiles are just an array of these uh, individual features. We put them all together into a table. That's essentially what a profile is. So um, the contents of these files are combined together in order to form single cell profiles. So each cell in an image will get a profile. You'll have um, X number of features, depending on the number of features that you um, extract from them. So we have this uh, script called collate.py. So what this does is to combine all these uh, the information in all these files and puts them together into a single file of features. And you have one feature, uh, single, sorry, single file of profiles and you have one profile for each cell. So once you have these single cell profiles, then what we do typically next is to aggregate these profiles. So if you have these single cells, uh, we have the profiles, we combine them together, uh, combine all the single cells within a well together in order to form these well level profiles. The well level aggregate profiles, you may be wondering why did we acquire all the single cell profiles and now we are aggregating them? Well, for most applications, these well level profiles have sufficient information content in them that you can use it for downstream analysis. But if you would like to go back to the single cells and work on those, you will still be able to do so. There are two different modes of uh, profile aggregation. Uh, we either find the means of all the features and then aggregate them based on their means, or we can do that using the medians of the uh, profiles as well. So once the features have been aggregated, the next step in the workflow is to annotate them. Uh, this is the easiest of all the steps, but um, it is also the most important for downstream analysis because not knowing what's there, which profile corresponds to which compound or which perturbation and where in the plate is a particular profile from, these inf this information is essential for running uh, downstream analysis. So the typical uh, annotations that we include during the profile annotation step are yeah, which perturbations are on a particular plate, um, uh, what, whether the perturbation is a control or a treatment. In the case of compounds, we may want to uh, annotate the profiles with their gene targets or the amyloid compounds or their uh, concentration and other information. Any metadata information that you may have, you may want to add to the profile because they may be useful in downstream analysis. Once we have these annotated or what we call the augmented profiles, what we do next is normalize the profiles. So normalization is crucial for eliminating noise in the data. Uh, there are two different types of noise that we typically remove in our typical workflow, but there is a lot, a lot, many more types of normalization methods that one could use to remove other kinds of noise. So in our workflow, we remove both plate effects, that is plate to plate variations. Typically in an experiment, you would have a number of different plates, uh, and in order to compare across these different plates, you may want to remove some of the effects that are specific to certain uh, to plates. And then you may also want to remove some batch effects. So these are, if you have multiple batches, in order to be able to compare across batches, you may want to remove these as well. And uh, we, there are two modes of normalization that we do. Uh, one normalization is, uh, is done with respect to all the perturbations on the plate. And the other is done with respect to just the negative control of the plate. I'll tell you a little bit more about this um, uh, in, on the next slide. And there are two uh, common types of normalization as well. We either do uh, standardization um, or we do mad order slice. And a little bit more details about these as well. So the way we do normalization is that we scale the features. We take the features, we subtract a quantity from it called its location, and then we divided by the variation in the data, which is a dispersion. So in the case of standardized, the location would be just the mean of the feature. So you take an individual feature, you calculate its mean, and you subtract it from each of the uh, each feature um, in your profile. Then you divide it by the dispersion. So this is essentially doing a z-score. There is uh, standardization is exactly the same as z-scoring. Then uh, we, uh, Separately, we can also do mad robustize. And here, the location is just the median of the features, and the dispersion is the median absolute deviation. So once we do this, we have 
the normalized profiles, then we can do the next step in the profiling workflow, which is feature selection. So in the case of feature selection, um, we try to remove certain features that uh, may interfere with some of the downstream analysis steps. So two main groups of features are removed. Invariant features, these are features that do not change at all across all the samples in your experiment. So this uh, feature doesn't have any information that will be useful, so those are removed. And then we also remove redundant features. So there are multiple features in cell profiler, we measure a lot of features which are, have the same information content as others. So we don't want to have too many uh, features having the exact same information content. So we would want to remove some of these. So we remove the redundant features as well. So that's a typical profiling workflow. Uh, after performing all these steps, now you have the process profiles that is ready for downstream analysis. So you may have a question now as to how can you get, uh, do perform these uh, uh, processing steps on your own. Well, the easiest way to do it perhaps might be to write scripts um, and use PySight Amender. PySight Amender has some functions for all these individual steps. And you may be able to uh, write scripts to call them and um, run the profiling workflow. Or the other way to do that, which is the method that we recommend right now, which is to run all these steps sequentially using what we call a profiling recipe. Um, you can find the profiling recipe in this link uh, provided here. I'll talk a little bit more about it in the demo. So the profiling recipe, you can consider it to be some sort of a wrapper along uh, around the, the PySight amino functions, and it can be uh, run by just configuring a single config file. You provide all the information that uh, the profiling recipe needs in the single config file, and it would run the entire profiling workflow uh, and process the, the profiles. So for the demo exercise here, I have actually created this data set. Um, the link here is how you can get to the uh, demo exercise. There are um, four replicate plates in this particular experiment, and there are 306 compounds on this plate. I provide a link to this plate map if you're interested in looking at it, but this is the visual representation of the same. So it consists of a bunch of positive controls. There are negative controls and also 306 different treatments on this plate. So this is the plates that we would use for in the demo exercise. So let me quickly switch to this tab, which uh, is a GitHub repository, which contains um, all the instructions for running the profiling uh, recipe and to generate the process profiles. Though this is in the form of a GitHub repository, you can very well treat this as a folder on your computer and you can run all these things locally on your machine. So there are a bunch of folders here. Uh, you may recognize some of these folders already, like for example, pipelines. So these are the pipelines that Beth was talking about for analyzing uh, cell profile features, but um, or extracting cell profile features. Uh, but there are other folders here as well, and the details about those, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of those right now, but these usually contains some important files uh, that uh, are generated uh, while uh, you're going through the profiling workflow from the images all the way to process profiles. Uh, the readme file here at the bottom actually gives you the instructions for rerunning the profiling recipe and to generate the process profiles. I won't go into all the details right now, uh, but I have provided all the information that you need here to go to the places where you can find uh, more details about uh, uh, how to generate this particular uh, folder. Um, yeah, so in order to rerun this on your own, you would have to download this repository or in the GitHub language, it's called cloning. So you have to clone this particular repository you would have to install all the default packages that it requires. I've provided the instructions here. Install these default packages and then run the profiling recipe uh, and provide the config file as an input to the profiling recipe. I'll quickly show you what the config file actually looks like. If you go into the config folder, you find this file. Uh, this is a simple YAML file, which has all these different modules and each one of them correspond to a different step in the profiling workflow. For example, you have aggregate, annotate, normalize, and feature select. 
So there are a bunch of these parameters that you need to define by default. The default parameters usually work best, so you don't even have to really uh, play around with it. But if you just use the default uh, parameters and then uh, specify the different uh, plates that are in your experiment, uh, in this case, there are four plates that I mentioned. Um, if you add them here, then you'll be able to run the profiling workflow in an automated manner from, uh, from single cell profiles all the way to process profiles. So once you run the profiling recipe, you would find that the profiles folder is now populated actually with profiles. So these are the four plates. I'll just show you an example of a single plate here. There are a bunch of CSV files here, and these are the different levels of profiles that have been generated as you go along the profiling uh, workflow. So the first file here is the aggregated profile, then it's followed by the augmented or the annotated profile. Then you have two different types of normalized profiles, one normalized to the whole plate, the other normalized to the negative control. And then you have two different feature selected profiles. These are profiles generated from these two different normalized profiles. So once you have these profiles, now they are ready for downstream analysis. And I'll now quickly tell you about what sort of downstream analysis that you can do with these profiles. Well, you have these CSV files, but one of the things that you could do with these CSV files is to actually reformat them into something called a GCP file that can be used in the Morpheus uh, software. So Morpheus is a no-code visualization analysis software developed at the road. Many of you may have already used this software. Um, this is useful for not just visualization, but analysis of higher dimensional data. So it's suitable for analyzing image-based profiles. The one good thing about the profiling recipe is that it can also generate these GCP files along with the CSV profiles that you saw. So if I go back to the root uh, directory here, we have GCT folder within which you have the GCT files. So this is the GCT file that would go as an uh, input to Morpheus. There are various tools inside Morpheus for performing some preliminary analysis with the data. And often with this preliminary analysis itself, you will get sufficient information that you can even make actual biological discovery. Uh, there's an excellent tutorial by Beth uh, in this link, and it tells you uh, specifically how to use Morpheus for analyzing image-based uh, profile, uh, uh, profiles from uh, generated from images. I today will give you a brief demo uh, using the data that we generated just using the profiling recipe the four plates that I said um, that we had used in this demo exercise. So if I go to Morpheus, this is the homepage of Morpheus. Um, you have uh, the option to um, add the file, drag and drop the GCD file directly here, or you could search your computer and add to Morpheus. And once you add it, it typically looks like this. So you have all these cell profiler features um, extracted, uh, extracted features on the along the rows here, and the columns here give you the sample IDs. Uh, this particular um, way of visualizing it is not but, uh, very helpful because, of course, we don't know what the sample zero to uh, n are. So a good thing to do would be to add some annotation to these profiles. Since we have already added these annotations to the augmented profiles to in the profiling recipe, we can do that here as well. So the way to do that is to go to view and options and you have your annotations here. And then you can add lots of different uh, columns that will be helpful for a visualization and analysis. For example, the kind of perturbation that you have, the type of perturbation, whether it's a positive control or a negative control or a treatment, and then maybe the well information, which well has which compound and the plate, which plate has which compound. So you can add any other metadata information here that are available. So these are all the metadata that you would have added in the annotation step. If you didn't add them there, you won't have them here. So once you add these annotations, you can make it look a little bit prettier by giving them color. So you can make it look something like this. And now it's ready for you to do some downstream analysis. There are typically two kinds of main kinds of downstream analysis that you could do on Morpheus with image-based profiling data. The first thing is to identify 
those uh, cell propeller features that are significantly different between two different populations. So to do that, you can do a simple t-test and find uh, out which of these sample, uh, which of these features clearly distinguish two uh, subgroups of samples. To do this, you go to tools, click on marker selection, change the metric to a t-test, and then choose the um, column that will help you distinguish these two populations. So let's say I choose perturbation type. So perturbation type tells you whether it's a positive control, or it's a control or a treatment well. And let's say that I want to find uh, those features that are significantly different between the controls and treatment. I will choose class A as a control and class B as treatment, and then run this by pressing OK. Um, I'll show you what the results would look like if I did that. And this is how it would look like. You can see all these features on the right here. They all have a T statistic and also a P value associated with them. Um, in this case, because this was a demo data set and I was just comparing all controls, both positive and negative controls against the treatments, we find that there are a lot many more features that would seem to be significant to have a P value close to zero. But if you're doing an actual experiment where we are comparing two different treatments, let's say, you probably wouldn't find these many features to be significant. But typically you have these uh, features and then you could talk to a biologist in the imaging platform to find out uh, if you have a feature of interest, they will be able to explain to you what they mean. Many times there is a biological explanation, but sometimes you may not have because uh, there are so many too many features which have very similar names and these are mathematical functions. They always don't have a biological meaning. So this is one kind of analysis that you could do during the t-test. The other thing that you could do is to calculate similarities between the profiles. So this is a very common type of experiment that you could do with uh, image-based profiles where you have different compounds in your experiment and all of them have different profiles. So we want to find which compounds look similar to each other. So you can do this by going back to the annotated data, going to tools and doing, uh, cascading a similarity matrix. There are different uh, metrics that you could use for cascading similarity. We typically use cosine similarity in the uh, imaging platform. So you could do that as well. And you could press on okay you're going to find this nice heat map where all the compounds are now plotted against other compounds and you have their correlation values. You can already start seeing that there are some compounds that look similar to others. To get a, a better picture of this, what you could do is to do a hierarchical clustering. So you can take the similarity matrix and then you can calculate, uh, you can plot the, uh, or do a hierarchical clustering and plot that for both rows and column, and then press on OK. This takes a little bit of time to run, so I've already done this, um, and this is how the results would look like. So as you can see, there's a lot of clustering. There are groups of uh, compounds which seem to look like each other. Since this is a demo data set, um, I don't know if there is any biological discovery that you would be able to make with this, but I wanted to highlight a couple of uh, things here. For example, you have this compound, AVL292, uh, even though these four rows of this particular compound come from four different wells, they seem to be clustering well together here. And the same is true for this SAR kinase uh, inhibitor, which also clusters nicely the four replicates of that compound. But what is interesting here is that these two compounds actually do cluster nicely together. So they seem to have a high correlation with each other. So let's say that uh, we do not know what the mechanism of action of AVL292 is by uh, using a guilt by association approach, we may actually be able to uh, infer from this that its mechanism action is probably very similar to that of the SAR kinase inhibitor. So you can actually make such biological discoveries or discovering mechanism of action of compounds using these simple heat maps. So that was Morpheus. And Morpheus and GCT files can be useful for making uh, doing a lot of preliminary analysis, but it may not be sufficient for answering all the questions that you may have. You may have to write some scripts. Uh, I didn't want to go into all the details here, but I wanted to provide an example script, uh, a Jupyter notebook uh, with a simple Python script that can compute a metric that we 
have started using as the default in our lab called average precision. And you can use this metric to identify compounds that have a signature that is different from that of negative control and also has a signature that is similar to other compounds which are targeting the same gene. So basically everything that I showed in Morpheus right now can in a way be summarized by this metric uh, that you could compute here. So once you, if you are interested in playing with uh, the profiling recipe and generating the profiles, please uh, go to the analysis folder and look at this notebook and try to run this as well. And you will be able to uh, generate uh, the average precision values for this particular play. I won't go into the details of this metric itself. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I can talk about this in more detail. So uh, once we have identified these compounds which have a high average position, perhaps then these can be used for other downstream applications. So, uh, so that was an introduction to the basics of image-based profiling and how to uh, generate and also do some preliminary analysis with uh, image-based profiles. So uh, with that, I would like to thank the members of the uh, current members of the imaging platform who are on the slide and also the former members in the lab who contributed not just to uh, PySidometer but also to the profiling recipe uh, that I was able to share with you today. So I'll answer your questions right now, but if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me on this email ID. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naraj and Beth. That was a really exceptional introduction uh, to such a powerful tool that it sounds like it's been made just accessible to a broad range of researchers, which is much appreciated as, as, a, as, a, yeah, as a user. Um, I was wondering, when you see people's projects come through, what is what is your um, pipeline most likely or most frequently paired with? I can obviously think of this as being paired with, you know, maybe like a, a NukeSeq or single cell sequencing to be able to provide the, um, you know, so the spatial resolution in addition to the uh, high level quantification uh, that happens with one of those kinds of technologies. But what other experiments do you commonly see this paired with? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we we love to see when people are actually doing that so we can try and figure out essentially if particular um, treatments sort of cause changes in direction. We, we've seen a lot of people combining profiling with L1000. Um, and so there's um, there's a paper in press um, right now led by Marzi Hagigi, so keep an eye out for that, um, that sort of looks at the uh, intersection of profiles um, from morphology in L1000. There's also a similar one um, from, from Greg Way that's in press looking at those specifically in the drug repurposing collection. Um, we would love to see things like single cell RNA-seq as well, but we uh, we haven't had many of those come through the lab yet, but would be totally interested in seeing it. That sounds great. And please, if anyone in the audience has a question, go ahead and post it in the Q&A um, or raise your hand and uh, we can unmute you to speak. Um, if, what kind of computational resources do you need on your computer? I know you had mentioned that it was easy to be able to interact, interact with a folder on your local computer. Does all the compute happen in the cloud and therefore you can do this on an iPad or what's the, um, what's the requirement? <laughs> yeah, so the second half of the profiling workflow, the one that I uh, discussed today, <laughs> most of the steps in that can be run locally on your computer. Um, like a local computer mean uh, probably a desktop computer. Um, these are not very uh, resource intensive. Um, for, for example, the demo exercise of four plates, it should probably run within five minutes on any local computer. But the initial process of extracting features from cell profiler, that's gonna be very computationally expensive. Uh, recommendation right now, I would say, would be to use the cloud for doing that. We have uh, different implementations of that within the lab that uh, Beth and Beth's team have shared with people where you could extract these features on the cloud. Uh, but yes, those I wouldn't recommend doing it on your laptop for any project that has like the number of plates. Maybe for a single plate, I don't know that that's recommended, but definitely not for uh, large experiments. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, so the Salt Profiler software um, runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It's not run on iPad yet, but um, yeah, depending on your local compute resources, um, you can definitely run a plate or two of data on a local machine, but it is a lot faster in the cloud. I will say um, our lab is working on a new tool called Pixini, which you can try at uh, pixini.app, um, which allows you to do deep learning classification um, and hopefully soon segmentation and stuff all right in your web browser. And so that actually works um, anywhere you have a web browser. So I've been able to train neural networks on my phone, which I always get extremely excited about because it's <laughs> phone. It shouldn't be able to do that, but it totally can. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for just an exceptional primer today, and we look forward to working through all the tutorials and resources that you so thoughtfully prepared. Thank you so much for having us.